So you went to your doctor with your floaters that you were concerned about, and they didn't seem very interested. They did a good dilated examination. They told you that your eye was healthy, your retina is good, everything's fine, and no mention of the floaters, and certainly no mention of treatment for the floaters. Um, you're reassured, it'll get better in a bit, you go home, and after a while you get a little frustrated and you start searching the internet. Maybe there's a cure, maybe there's a fix, maybe there's a treatment, maybe there's something for your floaters. Which kind of begs the question, why aren't more people treating floaters? I think it's a very good question. And I've got several issues that help explain that. The first is they're just not really considered all that important. So in our training, we are to be looking for pathology, um, macular degeneration, cat cataracts, glaucoma, uh, you know, dry eye, red eye, refractive errors, you name it. Uh, considered to be more pathological and more interesting, and the cynical side says, you know, there's more money in treating these things than there is in treating floaters. So uh, there's a bit of a, a, a dissonance and a mismatch between your idea of what's important and the ophthalmologist's idea of what, what is important. And so they're just not considered very important. Secondly, the exam goals are differently are different. So if you go in and you kind of want to know what's going on with your eye floaters, uh, the doctor probably again won't tr address that. Their goal is to make sure that there's no uh, more serious pathology going on, that, that there's no um, retinal hole, retinal tear, retinal detachment, uh, diabetic disease, scar, you know, anything that is, uh, is, is, is indicative of a more pathological and potentially you know, blinding situation. And medical legally, they got to protect themselves as well. They got to make sure, you know, we have to ask ourselves defensively, you know, what is the thing that if I miss could blind this person? And or what is the thing that if I miss I could get sued for? So they have a very different idea of what should be accomplished during the examination than you do, perhaps, especially if you're going in to have your floaters taken care of. Thirdly, the exam findings. Uh, I, have, I have seen a lot of floaters over the last 13 plus years, since 2007. That's all I've been doing is treating eye floaters, and I've seen some doozies. Uh, but even with some very significant um, eye floaters, so the, many of these patients will still have 20-20 you know, vision, you know, normal vision, uh, normal eye pressures, uh, clear cornea, clear lens, healthy retina. The things that we normally look for and chart in, on our examination uh, will come up as normal. And the reality is, is and, and one of my a uh, aphorisms is that uh, floaters are something that the patient sees, but the doctor doesn't necessarily see or doesn't necessarily fully appreciate the way that you do. And again, I am the floater doctor. I'm looking for floaters. And sometimes I have difficulty uh, uh, really fully appreciating the full extent of the problem. So again, this is something that you are very attuned to. It's affecting the quality of your vision, quality of your life. The doctor has not necessarily seen them. Seen them and the examination may be normal as far as they're concerned. Um, number four, dabblers give up. What do I mean by that? Um, there's been some changes in the marketplace. Uh, my, the laser company that manufactures my laser, uh, it's a very good laser, but they're selling the laser. Um, well, first of all, most cataract surgeons and, and most ophthalmologists need to have a YAG laser. So they're selling YAG lasers, but they're saying, oh, and by the way, you can use it for what you normally use for, but you can also treat floaters. And so uh, and many of these doctors will buy the laser and they're like, hey, uh, I got a patient, who's, I, I see a Weiss ring, I see a certain type of floater, let's get the, in there and treat that. They're treating a couple a month, maybe if that, I don't know. I, I don't think that they're treating very much because I'm not hearing about other, other uh, uh, floater treatment doctors unless the patient comes to me and says, I was treated and uh, there was no improvement or worse. I was treated and there was a complication. And so I, I think it's just one of those things that if you're just doing it sort of occasionally and just because you happen to have a laser and just because the salesperson told you that you can treat floaters, that's not the same thing as putting in the hard work. Malcolm Gladwell, an American author uh, in, the, in the book Outliers, said that you have to diligently practice a, a, a task, a skill, uh, 10,000 hours to achieve mastery of it. I don't know if I have 10,000 hours, but I've got about 14, 15 million laser shots. Uh, I've got to be approaching that. I don't know, but a lot. And uh, so if you're a dabbler, uh, you've had equivocal results, not really all that good, it, they might just kind of say, you know what, this isn't really working, and the patient isn't happy, you know, the money's fine, but it's, you know, the patient's not very happy. So they might just sort of give up. Um, or, or again, just do it once in a while. 
Um, number five, uh, there really aren't very good studies. Um, <laughs> when I set up my corporation for my medical practice, it was Vitreous Floater Solutions Research and Consulting Group. I really thought I was going to be able to do research with this. What I found fairly quickly is that there's no objective way to measure floaters that correlates with the patient's symptoms. Um, some of the patients of mine that are the most distraught, the most depressed, the most despondent, like nearly suicidal in some cases, seriously, like completely on the ledge, ready to jump. Um, you get in there and you look at their eyes and the vitreous is mostly clear. I mean, like actually really, really clear. And they might maybe have a few little fibers or little strands of, of collagen protein right up against the retina. 99.999% of the vitreous is clear and normal and perfect. And yet these patients are really distraught over this. Well, it's real. I mean, they have a real thing. It's just that, you know, we have no way of measuring the quality of that vitreous, the clarity of that vitreous in an objective manner that correlates with the, the patient's symptoms. You know, as such, it's really hard to come up with a good study. Now, it's not the first time in medicine. Uh, we have other very subjective things like pain. You know, everybody knows what pain is. Everybody's experienced pain. The physicians, the medical community, has no way of objectively measuring pain. We're still stuck with asking them on a, on a scale of 0 to 10, 10 is the worst pain you can imagine, you know, 0 is no pain, where are you on your pain scale? And they'll say it's a, it's a 5, it's a 7, it's a 2, whatever, and that varies from person to person. So there's, again, there's no, sort of, uh, no objective standards. Similarly with floaters, we don't have any objective way of measuring that. We just have to ask the patient, does it bother you? Does it bother you a lot? And, and then from my perspective is, you know, can I see it? Can I identify the culprit floater or flo floater group or cluster? And can I treat it safely? Um, and so, yeah, the, you know, we can't really rely on gold standard studies, big multi-center, uh, double blind, you're not supposed to say blind in, in ophthalmology, but you know, double blind, uh, placebo controlled studies, they just kind of don't exist. So that's kind of problem if you're trying to convince an entire medical community that this is legitimate and it's real. Uh, here are the studies that support that. Unfortunately, we don't really have that. Um, it's difficult. What can I say? Um, I've been doing this for quite some time. This is all I do. And I'm still challenged. I'm still challenged uh, by uh, you know, identifying the floaters, as I mentioned earlier, and treating them. And somebody, if somebody walks in with, uh, they've had a lot of corneal muckety-muck, they've had LASIK, PRK, RK, they've had cataract surgery, they've had a capsulotomy, they've got small pupils, and you're trying to work through that small opening with all that you know, corneal uh, irregularity, trying to work in that space behind it, it can be really, really, really challenging. Uh, I got a few tricks up my sleeve, I got, I've had a little practice at this, so I can kind of work around that generally. Um, but you know, it is it is a very technically difficult procedure to do. I wasn't born with these skills. I worked hard to acquire them, and there's nothing to prevent anybody else from doing that. Again, they have to put their Gladwellian 10,000 hours of practice in, and I don't see other people doing that. Um, it is also time consuming. Now, the way that I run my practice, the interaction with the patient takes a lot of time. Uh, very typically, for the first examination, we set aside an hour and a half. That's time to meet and greet, uh, chit chat a little bit, get the pupils dilating. Uh, I have a, a, a 30 minute educational sort of narrative uh, with visual aids, you know, explaining you know, the eye, the anatomy, the vitreous, the, uh, the laser, the laser physics, what can be treated, what can't, expectations, the whole thing. I do that personally. Uh, and then if they are a candidate, I'll go ahead and do the procedure, which might be another 20, 30 minutes or so. Um, that works for me because this is all I do and I'll see three, four, maybe five patients in a day and be able to allot that amount of time with them. Other practices, um, insurance-based practices, general ophthalmology practices are just not going to be able to dedicate that much time. Now, do I need to spend that much time with the patient? Probably not. It's my choice and it's the way I want to run my practice. It's more personal. It is me, not some counselor talking to them, not just a sheet of paper that says, you know, sign the consent form. I'm going through all that myself. So the way it works for me, it works. I don't think that anybody who has a general ophthalmology practice would be able to do it the way I do. Um, and, and so, you know, that is one of the differences in my practice. Um, no training. Um, there truly is no official teaching, training, certification, skills transfer uh, courses or, or seminars or, or anything uh, to teach these skills. And the reality is, even if I were teaching one of those, I don't know if I could do that to tell you the truth. 
Um, you can talk about it all day long, but again, you have to, you have to get, get in there and do it yourself. I've had doctors ask me if they could come and observe and if I could teach them and train them. I'm reluctant to do so. Um, it's not that I'm, a, I'm fearful of giving away the goose that lays the golden egg. Really is I don't want somebody looking over my shoulder because they're not going to learn anything. And, and by the way, if you're coming to see me, you're not going to get somebody else firing the laser. Um, I have delegation and control issues. I'm not going to allow somebody else who's coming to see me uh, to, to fire the laser on them just to practice and just to learn. So um, I have ideas, you know, in the long term I have some ideas on, on maybe, maybe some uh, online courses and things like that. It's going to take some time to, to, to do that if I ever do that at all. Um, but the reality is, is the doctor who just bought the laser and offers to treat your eye floaters, uh, they may have little or no experience whatsoever. You know, whether they tell you that, I don't know. Uh, and lastly, uh, the procedure is just generally not recognized uh, as a, a, a procedure that the medical insurers, at least in the United States, would, would uh, pay for or reimburse for. I had to make a business decision at the very out, uh, onset of my practice to uh, kind of go outside that, that, that medical insurance uh, model because, you know, I would submit a claim and they would reject it and then I have to chase after the pa patient for treatment. It's just not what I, it's not, I don't want to be doing that in my practice. Um, uh, so, you know, I just had to make, make a choice to kind of go outside that model. And I think if the other doctors are contracted with the standard insurance carriers, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, United Healthcare, Medicare, um, they can't really kind of go outside of that reimbursement sy system uh, uh, separately. So they're kind of um, obligated to submit a claim and then not get paid. Well, who wants to do that, you know? Uh, especially if you spend a lot of time with the patient. And so, you know, that's always going to be kind of a barrier to entry, uh, and all these are going to be kind of a barrier to entry for, for competition. So anyways, the, the question, um, why aren't more people doing it? We got a lot of reasons. I was very, uh, very fortunate to have kind of stumbled into treating floaters. Uh, it's been a fantastic practice for me. I just don't know if it would translate very well to your local doctor who claims to treat floaters. Uh, so as usual, uh, the Latin term caveat emptor, buyer beware. Do your research, do your dil due diligence, read through my website. Uh, ultimately, you have to go where you feel comfortable, um, and it just may be that the doctor closer to you may not be the best choice. Uh, so anyways, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, I'll have more of these videos going up as I can, and I hope you're learning something. Um, I'm putting the videos, which is kind of a, a duplication of some of the written material. Uh, I, as I look at my website, sometimes it just looks like a wall of words. So maybe this is a, a, a nether and maybe a better way to get that information across to you and a little bit more personal. So anyways, uh, thank you for watching. If you have questions, you can always contact me on the front page of my website. There is a contact form. Those come to me directly as emails, and I usually get to those within 24 hours or so. Um, and uh, when you are ready and convinced, you can call and make an appointment. Come out here to Southern California. We're in winter right now, and it's short sleeve weather, so maybe if you're up in the, in the cold north, it's not such a bad place to have to come to anyways. All right, thank you very much, and uh, maybe we'll talk later.